для советского народа это была Великая Отечественная война. Он вел ее во имя свободы и независимости своей социалистической родины, во имя избавления Европы, да и всего мира от фашистского порабощения. 20 миллионов жизней советских людей унесла эта война. Наш народ не забудет ее никогда. Леонид Ильич Брежнев. I'm Bert Lancaster. I'm standing inside the Kremlin. Behind me is the bell tower and the ancient cathedrals. In 1812, Napoleon captured the city of Moscow, and his army marched past these very same cathedrals. Shortly thereafter, the Russian army pushed the French back to the area of Belorussia. One of the heroes of that war was Prince Bagration. That is why the Soviets called their plan to free Belorussia Operation Bagration. It was the northwestern part of the Soviet Union that the Nazis occupied for three years during the unknown war. In 1944, they launched a massive attack which swept through Belarusia, and the Soviet troops continued westward across the German frontier. Our story, the liberation of Belarusia. In 1944, the turning of the tide. After three years of brutal fighting, the Red Army was slowly pushing back the German hordes that had overrun thousands of square miles of Russian soil. They marched west as liberators. The great heroes of Mother Russia, artists, philosophers, scientists, soldiers. A memorial in the ancient city of Novgorod, marking a thousand years of Russian culture. In 1242, the legendary Alexander Nevsky wiped out a German army bent on destroying Novgorod. 700 years later, Hitler determined to annihilate Novgorod, to melt down the bronze of the city's treasures for the factories of Germany. Hitler almost succeeded. Almost. After the war, Novgorod was restored to its ancient beauty. In 1944, Hitler had told his troops, none of the historic or artistic treasures of the East are of any importance. The German supermen reduced Novgorod's venerable cathedral to rubble, crushed its domes, hacked through its priceless frescoes. children of Siegfried, of Barbarossa, the children of Attila, had been shown a vision. The Aryan race, triumphant, Germany, all-powerful. The Third Reich to last a thousand years. From Poland through Russia to the Urals, where Asia began, one glorious new order.
That new order involved, of course, the extinction of the Untermensch, the subhumans of the East, and all their civilization. and property had been unimaginable. But what was most precious was still alive. It had been three years of horror. But now, in 1944, the Red Army had come back over the long and winding road the Germans had trod towards Moscow. Smolensk had been freed, and now Novgorod. And now they came to the first villages of Belarusia. Through the winter, the Red Army slugged westward along hundreds of miles of front. Morale was high. This was a battle-hardened army with victories behind it in the Ukraine, Moldavia, the Crimea. They were a broad tide of liberation. As winter turned to the mud of spring, they waited. With summer would come the campaigning season and the offensive that would hurl the Germans out of Belarusia for good. Soviet High Command began to issue its plans for the annihilation of Hitler's army group center. Four great Soviet army groups would strike simultaneously, liberating Belarusia, then breaking through to the Baltic, East Prussia, and eventually Warsaw. General Bagramian commanded the first Baltic front in the north. General Chernyakhovsky had the third Belarusian front. General Zakharov had the second Belarusian front. And on the southern flank, the first Belarusian front, it was the brilliant Rokossovsky.
rationed Bagration moved into gear on a front over 300 miles long. The Soviet concentrations were enormous. June 4th, 1944, Marshal Vasilevsky arrived from High Command Headquarters. On June 5th, Zhukov, it was almost time. As the Soviets awaited HR, there came spectacular news. It was June 6th, D-Day, the longest day, the long-awaited second front in the West. Two days before, on their drive north through Italy, the Allies had liberated Rome. By the end of the day, the Allies were ashore in strength in France and readying themselves to strike inland and begin the final act. Nearly 1,500 miles away, the Red Army was poised for its own hammer blow. Land and in the air, Soviet superiority was nearly four to one in planes, six to one in tanks, two to one in men. Methodically, the Red Air Force began to blanket the German positions facing the Red Army and interdict the routes over which reinforcements might come and the routes by which the Germans might seek to escape. Soviets wanted no escape. June 23rd, 1944, the Soviets orchestrated barrage and began to play with appalling force. Soviet barrage roared for more than 36,000 guns, mortars, and katyushas. Behind it, the assault infantry, nearly two and a half million men, waited.
While the battery still thundered, Zhukov unleashed his armor. Zhukov's power was fearsome. 118 divisions of infantry, 43 of armor, and 36 more divisions in reserve. The threat was so great that despite the second front in Normandy, all available German troops were hurried to the east. Army Group Center had had months to prepare its defenses. The Germans were famous for the strength of their bunkers and they held them with tenacity. Under the savagery of the Soviet attack, the Nazi defenses crumbled overnight. of annihilation, unceasing. One by one, the Red Army shattered the German divisions. Five, 10, 13. In less than a week, 50 German divisions had lost half their men. Enraged, Hitler moved his command headquarters closer to the front and replaced the commander of Army Group Center. It did no good. Six days, Zhukov had torn the German line to shreds. In retreat, the Germans were hounded mercilessly from the air and by partisans swarming out of the forest to take revenge. Soviets drove 90 miles to the west in those six days, liberating town after town. Orsha, Mogila, names that had not been heard of for three years since the first shock of the German invasion. Churchill said, the Russians have torn the guts out of the German army. There was no way home for Hitler's army group center. Ranging far beyond the battle line, Soviet Sturmoviks left their escape route a shambles. Six German divisions were surrounded at Bobruisk.
June 26th, the Red Army took Vitebsk. The Germans had been busy blowing up all the public buildings and destroying anything of value they could find. Now they were powerless to inflict further damage. Rokossovsky's steel pincers now reached out for the great city of Minsk. They trapped over 100,000 Nazis there in a ring of fire. On July 3rd, the Soviet tanks cracked the German defenses and Soviet infantry poured into Minsk. There was a day of heavy fighting in the midst of the flames, but by evening, the capital of Belorussia was free. Hidden in the ruins, the Germans had left thousands of delayed action bombs, mines and booby traps. People emerged from their cellars and shelters to thank their liberators. What had seemed a deserted city came alive. The Germans had left little that was usable in Minsk. No public buildings, no stores, no libraries, movie theaters, hospitals. No factories, no homes, no place to work, no place to sleep. A proud city reduced to rubble. Today, Minsk is a gleaming city of more than a million people, prosperous and trim. In 1944, the retreating Germans were determined to wipe Minsk and everything else in Belarusia off the face of the earth. They blew up factories, ravaged farms, slaughtered livestock, put villages to the tort, destroyed communications. They even invented special machines to do it with German efficiency. the Germans wrought gave the Red Army cause to make haste. When it was over, it was hard to know just what to do. First they wept for vanished homes, for loved ones lost, for themselves, for all humanity.
the magnitude of the defeat inflicted on the Wehrmacht was reflected in the faces of its former soldiers. Over 100,000 of them, with their commanders, had laid down their arms in the area of Minsk. More than half of them, 57,000 men, were shipped to Moscow. They were to provide a spectacle. July 17, 1944, the parade of the supermen, the Herrenfolk. Twenty abreast, unkempt and docile, all pride burned out of them. They shuffled in embarrassment down the broad boulevards of the Soviet capital. strangest events of the unknown war. No sound came from onlookers or marchers, save for the muffled tread of worn boots. The crowd uttered neither cheers nor curses. They stared at these impotent enemies who would not meet their eyes. During World War II, two small European villages, Oradeur sur Glan in France and Lidice in Czechoslovakia, received worldwide attention because of Nazi atrocities inflicted there. One more village should be remembered as a symbol of the unknown war, Katyn in Belarus. One morning in March of 1943, Hitler's SS troops marched into Katyn. They accused the villages of assisting the partisans in their underground war against the Nazis. They may well have been right. They rounded up every single person in Hattin, women, children, the elderly, everyone. They forced them into a barn, which stood on this very spot. They locked the door, and they set fire to the barn. 149 villages, including 75 children, were burned alive. By some miracle, Joseph Kaminsky, the village blacksmith, escaped. When he returned, he found his wife, and three of his children had perished. His 15-year-old son, Adam, was barely alive and died minutes later in his father's arms. Today, there is no village of Hatin. There is only this memorial of Joseph and his son to keep alive the memory of this inhuman act of war. 9,200 other Belarusian villages were burned to the ground by the Nazis. One out of every four Belarusians, 2,230,000 persons, were murdered in Belarusia during three years of Nazi occupation. The bells of Hatin. They toll for the dead. They toll so that we will not forget. Moving through Belarusia, the Red Army uncovered more and more evidence of Nazi atrocities. However much time might pass, the Russian people would never forget. I was not at home at that time. And then my neighbor came and said, they shot your child and your mother. This woman's entire family was destroyed. She refuses to forget. Then she told me, when the Nazis came into the house to take them, my girl begged them, Please, mister, don't shoot. Don't kill me. I'll sing my favorite song for you. So she stood on the bench and began singing for them. 
The Nazis took many people and shot them. They brought them into the schoolyard and killed them all. The Nazis had created winter in millions of Russian hearts. Even the generation with whom the future lay were made to suffer, perhaps because they were the future. Tens of thousands of them died. Starving, wounded, sick, mentally brutalized, all bewildered. They were nursed back to health, at least as far as external appearances went. The road to Hatim has found its own peace. In the summer of 1944, the Red Army reached the eastern bank of the River Bug, which formed the frontier with Poland, and drove on for Brest, the fortress that had fought so long in 1941 amid a sea of Germans. On July 28th, Rokossowski took the fortress by storm. army plunged across the boat. Poland lay ahead of them. On the northern flank of the Soviet offensive, General Bagramian's armies were clearing the Baltic states in quick succession, spreading through Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. Among the first to enter these newly liberated areas were units from the Baltic states fighting to reclaim their homeland. lands, as in Belorussia, the Red Army was sickened by what it found. The 
the camp at Kluge. All that remained of 2,000 human beings, most of whom were Jews. Shot, then stacked like cordwood for disposal. This man is a partisan, come to bid his wife farewell. She had died under torture, but she'd revealed nothing. Those she had protected buried her in the fields she had tended. Summer ended, General Bagramian had the sea at his side. Kaunas and Shaulai fell to him. Then Tartu, Nara. On September 22nd, Tallinn, the capital of Estonia. Tallinn. Once a pleasant port, full of history. A month later, on October 22nd, Riga, capital of Latvia, was reclaimed. Finally, the Baltic shoreline was swept clean of Germans. remained now was East Prussia. That was the mission of General Chernyakhovsky, at 38, one of the youngest of the Soviet commanders. He was both brilliant and energetic. He'd been at Novgorod in 1941, at the Dnieper crossing in 1943, and in Belarusia for its recent liberation. Chernyakhovsky planned well, but he did not see the fruits of it. He was killed by a mortar shell shortly after these pictures were taken. The Soviets had gained a foothold in East Prussia on the last day of August 1944, crossing the border at the little town of Shishup. They would break out of their lodgement in great force after the Red Air Force had eased the way. The British air assault was also pounding German troop dispositions and communication centers.
no one knew it yet, strange plots were afoot at the pinnacle of Nazi power. Hitler had long since assumed personal conduct of the war. He seemed as determined as ever to fight on, even if it meant bringing all of Germany down in his own fall. Some thought the best way to peace was to kill him. The attempt was made on July 24th. It failed. Some of the conspirators were shot out of hand. Some committed suicide. Those who lived were tried as traitors by a corrupt and cynical judge. All were humiliated. All sentenced to death. By an irony, among them was that same Count von Schulenberg, who had handed Hitler's declaration of war to Molotov. His power still supreme, Hitler ordered preparations for a long defense. In the early spring of 1945, the Red Army began the clearance of East Prussia, historic breeding ground of German militarism. The Soviet High Command assigned five infantry armies to the task. Hitler had declared Königsberg invincible. At the end of the second day's fighting, the Soviets had taken 130 city blocks and three fortresses. On April 9th, all Königsberg, the capital of East Prussia, was in their hands. Königsberg, city of Field Marshal Hindenburg, soul of Prussian military virtue. German losses of material were massive. In men, they amounted to 42,000 killed. Ninety-two thousand were taken prisoner at Königsberg. its great sweep westward that had begun in the summer of 1944, the Soviet Union had mustered the most powerful armies the world had yet seen. as Operation Bagration, named after the prince who had died on this field in action against Napoleon. Army Group Center and the return of freedom and dignity 
to the Republic of Belarus. Four million men had fought that battle. With 62,000 guns, 7,500 tanks, and more than 7,000 planes. The Soviets had obliterated 26 German divisions, inflicted losses of 60 to 70 percent on 82 more. It had been a bloodletting as terrible as any in the unknown war. to Vienna. After the Red Army had cleared the Nazis from Soviet soil, there remained the occupied countries of southeastern Europe. One by one, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Albania, Yugoslavia, and Austria became battlegrounds. The Red Army lost a million men in this vast campaign in the unknown war. 